The fight between India and Pakistan has lasted 70 years and counting. Nowhere is the animosity as fierce as in Kashmir, a picturesque territory turned battleground. Claimed by both nations, it's a legacy of the hatred formed when the British abandoned their Indian empire and carved it in two. I'm Steve Chow. On this special edition of 101 East, we examine how history continues to drive a high stakes conflict between India and Pakistan with no end in sight. Kashmir, once the scenic playground of kings. Today, it's one of the most militarized regions in the world. Where Pakistani and Indian troops face off daily. Where did you want to? Uh, Steve from Al Jazeera. Here in Pakistani administered Kashmir, few foreigners are allowed in. But we've been granted special permission. Thank you very much. Thank you. This mountainous region looks peaceful, but it's a highly volatile area where fighting can break out at any time. This here is the Pakistan side of Kashmir. Across the river, I can make out Indian forces and their bunkers. Tensions have been extremely high over the past several months. Heavy fighting has been reported along with casualties. Both Pakistan and India have accused each other of committing human rights atrocities. Over the last seven decades, up to 100,000 people from both sides have been killed here. The deadly violence began from the moment the two nations of India and Pakistan were created. The accession of Kashmir is the unfinished business of partition. The partition in August 1947 saw the British Indian Empire split in two mostly along religious lines. Pakistan was intended to be the Muslim homeland. India intended for Hindus and Sikhs. It was a recipe for trouble. When it came to decide which parts of India should be part of India and which parts of India should become part of Pakistan, um, you had an impossible job because uh, Muslims were scattered about all over the place. As the new nation's flags were raised, violence exploded, leaving a million people dead. In terms of the human tragedy that accompanied partition, the violence, the murderous hatred uh, that broke loose, uh, I think the consequences of that have really scarred subcontinental psyches. Um, and that in itself is a major hurdle uh, in coming to a resolution um, that would be workable in the long run between India and Pakistan. Increase the delicacy of the relationship between the two new dominions. And in the midst of all that chaos, Kashmir, Kashmir was the biggest hurdle. It was a Muslim majority state ruled by a Hindu Maharaja. There had been troubles in Kashmir where India supported the Maharaja. The complication being that Kashmir was geographically close to both India and Pakistan. And the feeling was on the part of Pakistan that Kashmir would naturally accede to Pakistan. In many ways, it should have gone to Pakistan because it had a, a Muslim majority, but its, its Hindu Maharaja chose for it to come to India. It was a choice forced on the Maharaja when weeks after partition, Pakistan sent in fighters. Already, the rebel forces have left a trail of looted and burning villages in their wake. The Pakistanis simply sent in a large number of troops. In fact, many of them were so-called irregulars, armed tribesmen from the northwest, into Kashmir to seize the territory and overthrow the Maharaja. 
They engaged in uh, rampage uh, and eventually that prompted uh, the Maharaja uh, to call upon the Indian uh, government to send in the troops. Reinforcements continue to pour in as the Indian troops consolidate their gains. Another stage in a dispute which uh, India promptly paratrooped in some India, soldiers. Um, they beat back uh, some of the uh, invasion, but a ceasefire was called, leaving Pakistan in control of roughly one third of the western side of Kashmir um, and, and leaving the rest in Indian hands. That ceasefire in 1948 has resulted in what is now known as the line of control. Today's Front line. But it remains the big unhealed wound between India and Pakistan, the, uh, the bone that neither dog will let go. India and Pakistan have fought two brutal wars over Kashmir, and the battle rages on. Troops against troops, civilians against soldiers. To Pakistan, India is a ruthless occupying force in a Muslim-majority land. For India, Pakistan and its military intelligence service, the ISI, have been carrying out a campaign of terror on its territory for decades. The Indian army has always faced Pakistan's determined intelligence effort to um, uh, send militants across the border into Kashmir to train up jihadis. Many of them have been armed, trained, financed, equipped, and occasionally even officered by the Pakistani military. Uh, the Pakistani ISI has embarked upon what has been described in Pakistani literature as a war of death by a thousand cuts. We learned never to underestimate the enemy. For General Assad Durrani, the former head of Pakistan intelligence, using any means to defeat the enemy is justified. For me, any asset that can be used for a particular purpose is a legitimate tool. I had a good tool. Durrani served in the military for four decades, and as the intelligence chief, he was responsible for Pakistan's strategy against India. We use every asset. If you do not have enough conventional assets because of a larger enemy, you do not only rely on a conventional response. And among those assets, Mujahideen fighters, allies of Pakistan who in the 1980s had been waging war in neighboring Afghanistan. When the Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan, a lot of the Mujahideen with nothing else to do were diverted by their Pakistani handlers to uh, foment violence in Kashmir. And they principally are the ones responsible for the destruction of Kashmiria. Armed by Pakistan, the battle-hardened Muslim fighters poured into Indian-administered Kashmir. India hit back hard, crushing the armed movement, and anyone thought to be supporting it. The Kashmiris remained pretty neutral until the 1990s when excessive violence by Indian security forces, which in many cases raped Kashmiri women, uh, behaved in a, uh, in a terrible manner. And there were terrible torture chambers set up in Kashmir uh, with uh, electric shocks being used on the genitals of young Kashmiri kids. I mean, lots and lots of horrors took place. And Kashmiris today are, are very alienated, very, very alienated from India. Not all of them want to be part of Pakistan either. I certainly would not suggest that Indian uh, forces have been um, always, shall we say, uh, the most tactful or diplomatic in the way in which they've conducted their, uh, their operations. Historian Shashi Tharoor is also an Indian opposition member of parliament. You can imagine the enormous pressure they're under in a conflict in which um, a hostile neighboring state is funneling uh, armed people, weapons, bombs, counterfeit money, all sorts of resources. It's very, very hard to, uh, to maintain self-restraint in the face of all of that. But in the meantime, innocent, ordinary human beings are suffering at both ends. They're suffering terrorist violence, intimidation and menace on the one hand, and the inevitable repression that comes on the other side. Seventy years on, 
Kashmir is no closer to peace. It's been a, 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 a worsening spiral of uh, Pakistan encouraging militancy, the Indian state cracking down, the crackdown then creating more resentment, some of the ones who are resentful going off and, and, and getting training and equipment coming back to be militants, and the cycle keeps going on. In Islamabad, Pakistan's capital, we come to a rally condemning India's presence in Kashmir. It's run by a group India and the U.S. consider a terrorist organization. Firing up the crowd is Hafiz Abdul Rahman Maki, leader of Jamaat Udawa a group the UN says is a front for Lashkar-e-Taiba, responsible for deadly attacks in India, something the group has always denied. As the rally breaks up, we make our way backstage to try and speak with Maki. The U.S. has put a $2 million price on his head. It's not surprising, then, that he's well guarded. Can you truly say you're not sending fighters, weapons, into Kashmir or beyond into India? Can you truly say that? I can say that I have never sent anyone to Bharat. There is a military there, heavy equipment. But Indian officials say Mackey's group is far from peaceful. They accuse them of masterminding deadly attacks on Indian soil. In 2008, heavily armed gunmen entered the city of Mumbai, killing 164 people and injuring more than 300. After initial denials, Pakistani officials confirmed the attackers were all from Pakistan and all linked to Lashkar-e-Taiba. Even then, it took almost a decade before Pakistan put Hafiz Saeed, the group's leader, and Maki's boss, under house arrest. Has your group not sent fighters into India? This is only propaganda. Instead, Maki blames Hindu nationalists for carrying out a campaign of violence against Muslims. In India, over the past 25 years, there have been major outbreaks of religious violence that have killed thousands, mostly Muslims. Sporadically, in such a large country, in some places, there might be a couple of incidents of communal strife. Ram Medev is the general secretary of the ruling party, the Hindu nationalist BJP. He's also a former spokesman for the RSS a right-wing group often accused of encouraging violence against Muslims. No effort from our government, from the government side to promote any communal strife. On the contrary, we are committed to maintaining peace and communal harmony in the country. Rights groups say since the BJP came into power in 2014, attacks on Muslims have surged. It's a charge Madev rejects. Totally false. In fact, the last three years have been the most peaceful period when it comes to intercommunal relations in India. But for some, 
the reality is starkly different. We've come to the region of Maywat, which is predominantly Muslim. It's communities like these that are starting to feel the heat from the more violent elements of Hindu nationalists. Dairy farmers Irshad Khan, his father, and some neighbors were returning home from a cattle market with two cows they'd bought. Suddenly, they were attacked. So we had three people with us. So the three people told us, stop the car. There were eight or nine people with us. हमने उनसे बोला भाई साहब हम मेले से लेकर आए हैं ये हमारे पास रसीद है फाड़ कर फेंक दिया बोले कि हम तो गौरक्षक वाले हैं हमारा आगे हुलिया क्या करता है क्या हुलिया होता है हम हुलिया को कुछ नहीं समझते हैं For Hindus cows are sacred Recently there's been a spate of attacks by Hindu vigilantes targeting those they suspect of slaughtering cattle उनने नुकनु ही हमारी मारपीट चालू कर दीजिए तुरंत ही और मारपीट करते समय जी इतना मारा इतना मारा कि जा कि ये समझ लिए कि अब ये पांच लोग मर गए और खेंच खेंच कर उठा कर हम पांच लोगों को इकट्ठा गिर दिया इकट्ठा गिर कर बोले कि भाई डीजल ले आओ पेट्रोल ले आओ और इनमें आग लगा दो इरशाद मैनेज्ड टू स्केप विद हिज लाइफ ही वाज लकी his father died from his injuries two days later, devastating the family. हमारी अम्मी भी पागल हुई पड़ी है, ये भी पागल हुई पड़ी है। बाली औरी नहीं, रोटी खाती नहीं। जिस दिन से हमारा पापा मरा, उस दिन से इसको देखना भी बंद हो गया। बुढ़ापा है, एक लाई बेटा था। यारदास्त नहीं जाती है जी इसकी। उसको याद रखती है हर बकत, हर बकत रोती है, र अम्मी के भी यही हाल है। अम्मी भी रात को रात को रोती है कई कई बार हम रात को खड़े होके नहीं सब बहन भाई तो रात को भी रोती है दिन को भी रोती है पर क्या करें जी अब तो फिर अब तो दिल समझाना ही पड़ेगा जी हम भी रोएं ये भी रोएं रोने से तो कुछ हो नहीं रहा। Irshad not only lost his father, he says he also lost his old way of life, one where Muslims and Hindus live together in peace. ये आगे जाके चेंज होने वाला है जी इसका जो ये मकसद है ये ये बना रखे हैं गाँव रक्षक इनका मकसद है कि ये इनकी भाई बंदी खत्म कर दे हिंदू मुसलमान का भिड़ाने का इनका मकसद है जी आव गवर्नमेंट इस वेरी क्लियर वेदर इट इस काउ विजिलेंटिज्म और समाधर विजिलेंटिज्म नो ग्रुप हैज एनी राइट टू � Despite the government's assurance, the Khan family is still waiting for justice. Months after Irshad's father died, his alleged killers are yet to face trial. Increasingly, hardliners in both India and Pakistan are stoking religious and political divisions. In Mumbai, we find these prejudices alive in the younger generation. Pakistan ne ham log ke desh mein bahut saare bomb blast kiye. Isliye mere ko Pakistan pasand nahi. Log ke desh mein jaate hai to wo log ham log ko pakad ke jail mein dalte hai. Kyunki mere ko Pakistan kabi pasand nahi hai. Kyunki Pakistan se nafrat hai India ko. Across the border in Islamabad, we find more kids who share a passion for the same sport and harbor the same hatred. India is our enemy because they sell our country and they kill our people because they and they are bad for our people. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow. इसी तरह मुजाक उड़ाते हैं मुसलमानों का मुसलमानों को कत्ल करते हैं अगर वो मुसलमान हैं तो मुसलमानों को इकुन कत्ल करते हैं बाहर भी और मुमालिक्स में लोग हैं उनको कत्ल क्यों नहीं करते सिर्फ मुस्लिम पे अटैक क्यों होता है 
So what did your grandmother say to you when you first said to her that you wanted to go to India? She said over my dead body because only snakes live there. Pakistani author and activist Anam Zakaria wants to change those negative attitudes. But she admits it's not going to be easy. In many ways, I think that today's generation is far more hardline and antagonistic and more partitioned than the generation in 1947. Because even though a lot of families, you know, who, who migrated, who suffered partition, went through horrific tragedies, there was also codependence. There was also coexistence. For the younger children today, there's no coexistence. In a Pakistan, you don't come across an Indian, let alone a Hindu or a Sikh even. According to Anam, it's a situation made worse by government censoring the story of what happened in 1947. The state has emphasized and reinforced certain partition narratives over other partition narratives. So what you're then reading in textbooks or in the media and narratives that are also state-sanctioned is a lot of antagonism and hostility and only narratives of bloodshed. And, and I've experienced this with my own grandmother who, you know, for 25 years of my life only spoke about the bloodshed till I asked her, did you have a Hindu or a Sikh friend? And all these stories started to come out. And she said, didn't you know, you know, a Sikh family helped save my sister at partition? I said, no, I didn't know. You know, these stories have escaped generations. The absence of these stories from official history has come at great cost. A young child who's hearing that, you know, Hindus are responsible for all genocide and Hindus must never be trusted and must never be made friends uh, with, how, how do you expect that child to think anything else? These are children that are going to school and are memorizing hatred. Hi. Oh my God, you've all become so tall. How are you? Anam is now working with young people in both Pakistan and India to help build bridges between the two countries. She invites us to an online chat between students in Karachi, Pakistan and Mumbai, India. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you see us all? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we had some questions for you. What is Mumbai like? I, we've never been to Mumbai. This is the first time some of these teenagers have ever spoken to someone across the border. Mumbai again is very, very famous for its street food. So we have all kinds of street foods. Like you can find whatever you want anywhere. So we've got what I'm trying to do now through my work is get them to talk to each other and get them to access these alternative histories that are present, whether it's through Skype exchanges or whether it's to, through talking to my own students, you know, and working through the stereotypes and challenges. To be honest, I'm not really trying to be offensive, I swear, but we haven't heard good things about Pakistan. Uh, it's just that... The enmity is going on since forever. To be honest, like it's the same on this side. Uh, we're not exactly taught a lot of good things about India. They are like... Um, These casual chats may not seem like much, but they have a big effect. Uh, meeting people and realizing that they too are people just like us has been um, really important in like shaping my view of what India is. They're just as into our culture and they're just as into our musicians, our movies, our actors as we are into theirs. And when you guys yeah. do visit, you should meet all of them. Now I know how they are just like us and there's no point in hatred. Hatred was made in a spark, but the thing to get everyone cooled down will take a lot of time. And I think it's very important to let them express that hatred, you know. Uh, because I don't think you can move on from partition because partition is an static event. Because it continues to shape us, it will continue to impact us. Anam and these students are trying their best to reach across the divide. Yes, that girl. But 70 years of hostility are difficult to overcome. Bye-bye.